European investors that don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit regarding your background? Uh, sure. I am 46, 47 years old now, actually. I had a birthday last week. Just moved to Florida from New York. I've got six kids. That's my why in life. My why is my big family. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very passionate about the family. So, I mean, why real estate? I was in the restaurant business for over 20 years, and I was actually a successful restaurant entrepreneur. I wasn't netting 4% like the average restaurant. I was doing fat rather well, but you know what? Working on Christmas Eve, working on Easter, working all those holidays when I should be home, working on the weekends tends to burn you out, right? I just didn't want to do it anymore. And as I got to a point in my life, I became stuck. I went to coaching school. I became a certified life coach, which totally revolutionized my life. I, I looked at things in a different way. You know, what's a limiting belief? What's an assumption? All these things I learned that were holding me back, they're energy blocks. And most of the blocks in our life are, you know, they're in, they're not the exterior, they're the interior blocks, things that we think of, things that are holding us back. I'll give you one perfect example real quick. Back in 2008, I blamed Obama, Barack Obama for the for the economy, for what was going on. It wasn't Barack Obama, it wasn't George Bush, it was Gino Barber that was having the problem because there were a lot right. of other people out there making millions of dollars. But me was the, you know, I was not being responsible. I was being the victim like most of the people in the United States are. 90% of the people are victims, hence 90% of the people when they retire don't have money to live because they're victims. So I said to myself, I'm smart enough where I can figure things out. So I went for the personal responsibility. I went for the growth. I'm a bookworm like you. I got Tony Robbins all around me. So I, I figured it out. I said, let me get that, that personal growth. So that's what led me to multifamily. While I was working in the restaurant, I can do this part time. I can find a partner or I can buy stuff by myself, manage the real estate and continue to work full time. Fixing and flipping wasn't an option for me because I didn't want another job. The tax consequences of fixing and flipping are much different than multifamily. Multifamily's got some really nice tax benefits. I wanted a long-term generational cash flowing wealth. That's what I was looking for. And that's what multifamily uh, investing uh, really, I guess really was really clear for me. Um, I bought my first property. I'll give you the first property that I bought by myself. It was a total disaster. Um, didn't do my due diligence. You know what that word is, right? Every entrepreneur knows that. I bought a mobile home park with a friend from another investor. Okay. I didn't fly down to Florida. I should have, right? I should have, and you had spoken about this. It's not the deal, it's the sponsor. It's the person who's putting the deal together. I'd rather have a marginal deal with a kick-ass sponsor than a great deal with a crappy sponsor, if that makes yeah. any sense, because a sponsor yeah, is nice. really important because you're always an investor looking to get your money back. With that crappy sponsor, if something goes wrong, He's out of there. But if you have a hard rock sponsor like me, I'm going to take it on my shoulders. I'm going to make sure you get your money back before I do. And if something does happen, I will be responsible for that. So you're always looking for the sponsor. And that was not the sponsor that I had in this mobile home park. It wasn't the mobile home park that was bad. And ultimately, that's when the, that's when the shift came for me because I'm like, that's not my his fault. It's ultimately my fault because I didn't vet him out. That deal went bad. Then I bought another deal in commercial. It was a strip mall, which... I want to stay away from uh, commercial right now as far as the best buys, these little strip malls, because the internet and the Amazon is just destroying everything. Sure, sure. Sizes are coming down, people work in their houses. I'm in my office in my home right now, so office space is just, that space is very difficult. So I learned that the hard way, that was the second one. Then that's how I got the multifamily. And you know, Jake and I bought our first deal in February of 2013. It was a 25 unit property. Six months later, we bought a 36 unit property. Then a year after the first purchase, we bought 136 units. Now, was it luck? Was it timing? It was a little bit of everything. We finally decided to do it. The market was still relatively you know, calm. The cap rates were still pretty good. We got in a good time, but the thing is, like I said, we got in a good time. You know, When you work harder, you get luckier. And when you get luckier, you work harder. And that's what happened to us. Um, and I was fortunate to get in with, with Jake. He knew very little about the business. I knew more. I had the coaching skills. It's like The Richest Man in Babylon, my favorite book to read, yeah, because too, every, everyone thinks Arkad was lucky, but he wasn't lucky. He, was, he worked hard. He made a mistake like I did. He made another mistake. He really learned he aligned himself with smart people and then when an opportunity came along like this 25 unit for me and jake we took that opportunity people would have said oh you got lucky you found a deal well luck found us because we we're working hard so i yeah, hope I that like, it's yeah it's it's, it's a preparation meeting uh, it's that that saying right yes so yes. But, but I, don't, I, want, I want to just just clear out some of the misnomers that because people that are born in this disease you know the grand cardone speech right the, the disease yes. called uh, average um, average and that's that's okay because th that that's not okay. But what's okay is that we are tackling this issue because um, it's supposed that 
you you have to kind of upgrade your previous generation so you are improving <coughs> and this is great because your kids are going to uh, kind of come from a, a higher platform and this is super so it's our job in order to get this to, to work so what I would like you to clear out is uh, this common misconception that it, it takes money to get into real estate because this is an important thing to do do you did you need a source of income in order to get your first deals or did you kind of like got um, that you look for a deal and then look for partners in order to invest in it? Can can you run through this? That's a great that's a great point because my parents are both immigrants from Italy, so I'm first generation here. Okay. And I always learned growing up, you need money to make money. Money doesn't grow on trees. Although my parents were we we had a really nice lifestyle. My father owned the restaurant, so I came from that mantra. So I always stuck inside my head. I didn't know about owner financing. I didn't know about getting partners. I didn't know about syndicating deals. And, and ironically, on our first deal, it was a distressed property. It was a motivated seller. And on those kinds of deals, you can get owner financing. So on our first deal was $600,000. We got owner financing, 10% owner financing, and we got 80% bank financing. So we only needed to come up with $87. I remember that number. $87? So $87,000. No, $87,000. Yeah, I wish. Uh, that'd be great. But I'm, I'm going to tell, you, I'm gonna tell you a better story. But let me tell you the first one. So this is our first deal. So we don't even know what we're really doing. We stumble upon it, right? And then what happens is it's me, my brother, and Jake. So it's $27,000 each. We buy this $600,000 property. Fast forward two years later, the value of the property went from $600,000 to over $800,000. We okay. refinanced the property. We pulled out $180,000. We only had 87,000 in, we have 180,000 out. So tax-free, refinance how long, property. how long was that a time span? Uh, it took us two years. Two years. Two years, okay. two years where we went to the bank and then it took a couple more months to do the whole refinancing stuff. Um, but that's, we, like I said, the luck started because we bought it right and we always focus on trying to buy right. So do you need money in these deals? If you find the deal, you don't need the money. You can find people with the money, but you have to know how to structure the deals. You have to know that you've got a deal. You have to, you're always looking for value, right? So on our one of our uh, previous deals we did two years ago, this property was 281 units. It was listed for $12.6 million. It was uh, what we call a mom and pop. We love the mom and pops. Yeah. It was basically motivated sellers. It was a family. They wanted to sell this property. They had tried to sell to the brother. The brother couldn't handle it. And it was one of those properties where the REITs, the really big companies don't want to deal with it. And the smaller investors, they really can't buy it because it's too big. Sure. So Jake and I looked at it and we said, there's a lot of value here. The, the buildings are great. It's in great condition. The only problem was it was a little spread out. So management companies really didn't love to manage this thing. So we said, you know, Jake, let's take a run at it. So we, and we how, showed, how many units? How many units? 281. 200 and okay. 281. So there was yeah. one that had 156 contiguous units in one parcel, and then another one was spread around the university. So it was a nice asset. This gentleman built all these properties. So over the last 30 to 40 years, he just wanted to cash out. He was about 72 years old. He wanted he wanted out. So we have the motivation, and you need motivation in real estate. I think, or in any other industry in business, to be able to get some kind of deal because you don't want to buy it retail, right? And you want to buy motivated, and you want to you want to solve somebody's problems. So this guy, he just wanted out. He had his sisters working in the office making a big salary he had his brother there and he had built his portfolio so he wanted just to sell so we went over there we showed him our underwriting and he said at 12.6 million this doesn't work you know put something in writing when you're negotiating with somebody just don't speak it send your underwriting over to the gentleman and say listen at 12.6 million we're getting a two percent cash on cash return this is not not working out for me so he came back and he and that's the great thing about it he negotiated against himself we didn't even mention a number he went down to 11 million dollars with 20 percent owner financing. So we bought 281 units with no money out of our pocket. 20% he held the note, 80% bank financing. Now this wasn't our first deal. We had, we had already about 350 units under contract, under under management. So the banks were like, uh, you know what, we're not sure. But the one of the banks said, hey, listen, if these guys don't pay the mortgage, the guy with the second note is just going to come in and take the property over. So there's really not that much risk for the banks. So the bank said, sure. So we ended up buying 281 units, no money out of our pocket. At the closing, we actually got money back because we bought at the beginning of the month. We got prorated rents. We got some cable money there. We got a little bit of a repair allowance. So not only did we not put any money into the deal, we actually got money at closing. The lady the title company is like, I've never seen this before. How are you guys buying $11 million asset and you're, not, you're getting money back? And the great thing about it is we just refinanced that property. Um, 
2000, I'm trying to figure out the numbers. We refinanced two portions of it. We paid back the seller his 20% note. Now we own that free and clear. We paid him off his note and we have the asset without any money in our pockets and it's just generating money every single month. So that's, that's doable, that's possible. And if people say you can't do that, you can do that. If you're looking for the opportunity, you'll find that opportunity. And where, where would you look? Because every time that uh, the market is kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of a wheel and thing, it's a, it's a system, right? Uh, things happening, happening over and over again in everything that mm -hmm. you do in life. Every time that you place yourself in a position that you are asking someone uh, for something, you're right. basically, especially for money, basically you are placing yourself in a place of dependency. And what mm -hmm. I'm saying this because, um, I, uh, er, have you ever been in a position where you had a great deal but you couldn't find investors so when the, w uh, the deal went, uh, went go through because you just couldn't find the money to get the deal done? We haven't done that yet, but what I'm doing with Jake and Gino, and that's what led me to, I started the education company about two years ago. We have the number one podcast I know, from I know. all the and iTunes. So yeah, I started yeah. that because I love talking to you. You can tell I've got a lot of passion for yeah. this. I love talking to people and helping people. But the offshoot of that is people like, well, are you syndicating deals? Are you looking for investors? So all of a sudden, I'm starting to grow an investor base from the podcast because people know, you know, if you want to know my strategy, I have an educational platform that I can sell to you. I have a best-selling book that I can give to you. You can read what I'm doing. You can watch the videos and say, hey, sure. this is a sound strategy. So people are coming to me right now, and we haven't syndicated yet because we've been fortunate where we've been refinancing the properties and repurposing the money into the assets. So what happened is we've grown dramatically. In three and a half years, we went from zero units to almost 700 really quick. Uh, the last eight to 12 months, we've taken a little bit of a pause because, you know, as an entrepreneur, all of a sudden, you're running two little properties. It's a lot different than running eight properties. Sure, so what happens sure. is as far as management systems, as far as software, as far as dealing with other vendors, you start growing, you want to really tighten those systems up. You see your expenses creeping up. You know, expenses on, on 30 units are a lot different than expenses on 300 units because yeah, you have yeah. all of a sudden we have 19 employees. We didn't have any employees three and a half years ago. So that's what starts happening. So I haven't had that problem with not having the money. But I guarantee you, if you find the deal, especially in this market, in this economy, in this climate, you reach out to what I call your power base. And Grant Cardone talks about it. You write down your mom, you write down your dad, your brother, your uncles, your aunts, your brother's friends, your brother's employers, your employers, your you know you, your employer's friends. You would be amazed at how many people you know from that power base. You have to show yourself as credible too, because if you're asking people for money, you're not asking them for money. You're asking them that you're going to give them an opportunity. Really, right, play yeah. on words. Because if I'm asking you for money, you're like, "What do you want my money for?" But hey, you know, Diogo, I got an opportunity here. You can make ten percent sure. on your money. Yeah, you have money. So it's all about the mindset. Yeah. A, di a different mindset when you say the different words is true. Completely, and and you have to make yourself credible. You have to learn an elevator pitch. You have to learn that 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 strategy or that investment implicitly and you always have to say to yourself and this is one of the reasons why we didn't syndicate or initially and take other people's money i wasn't comfortable with it in the very beginning now i feel very comfortable we have a very solid model we know what we're doing so if i'm going to take your money i feel very comfortable that i'm going to get it back to you right so in the beginning i didn't feel that comfortable i said if i'm going to lose i'm going to lose on my own but now that i've got a proven model proven track record i feel comfortable doing that yeah, and I, I think that it's especially, especially for me because I haven't done my first deal yet. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it looks harder because it's the first one. But after you do the, uh, I saw your interview and you told about this uh, recurrently. After you do the first one, the second, the third, and the fourth, it's much easier because. <laughs> <laughs> I, equate it to having, I equate it to having children. <laughs> When you have your first child, right, it is life changing. All of a sudden, your time is not your time anymore. It's their time. You have the second one, you, you know, it's, it's you and your wife in this too, right? You have the third one, it's three against two, but all of a sudden you've gotten skills, right? I mean, they don't give you a book when you take the child home, that's but true. by the time you've had the third one, you see certain things working, certain patterns working. Tony Robbins talks about it. There's patterns in life. So by the time you have your fourth and your fifth one, I mean, is it hard? It's obviously hard as far as monetary, but you sort of start to figure it out and then you all of a sudden- better. You'll become better. Yes, and you start to enjoy it, right? So, I mean, I have six, I'd love to have more. I wish I, you know, I'm getting a little up there in age, but it's the same thing with multifamily. Once you start doing a couple, it's the same pattern you know he says how to bake chocolate chip cookies or brownies you get the recipe you learn the recipe really well you follow the recipe you're gonna get the same type of cookies every single time and it's the same thing in, in, in real estate learn that recipe repeat that recipe and keep doing it and you'll have success that so way would you would you say let's say for for a um, first start uh, starting an investor 
would you say it's a, a good practice to spend like a, uh, a, a huge chunk of your of your day looking at, at prop, uh, pros, um, uh, prospective deals and then putting some properties in, in contract and then pr presenting it to to possible investors? Sure. Well, the first thing I think anybody has to do is really focus on a market. Pick a city or two cities where you really want to focus on because deals are going to be completely different. Real estate's market specific because something in yeah. the Northeast or New York is going to be completely different than something in Atlanta, Georgia. It's just completely different. So what I want yeah. people to do, the first thing you have to do is focus on a market. Whatever market you want, if you want something that cash flows a little bit more, that's a little more stable, the Midwest is great. It's called a linear market. It doesn't grow. It just stays stable, but it cash flows like crazy, right? If you want something that's a little bit hotter, that's got a little bit of emerging market, maybe you come down to the southeast in Florida, some parts of California, it's more like you say that bell-shaped curve. It goes up and down. There's a little bit more risk there. So it all depends what you want to do, what your strategy is. Is your strategy to become financially free and get out of the rat race? Then I would go with that cash flowing market, that linear market. Kansas City, Missouri is good. Louisville, Kentucky is a pretty good market. The Tennessee markets are pretty good markets. Uh, Atlanta, some parts of Georgia are, are pretty good in those markets. Focus on the market first. Then when you do that, start looking at deals in those markets. Start learning the city. Where do you want to invest in? Stay away from the D areas. Don't go into those really drug infested, crime ridden areas because you're going to fix the property up and it's going to get destroyed again. There's no value. There's no equity creation there because yeah. it is what it is in these areas. Focus on who you want to serve. We serve C properties. We serve uh, blue collar tenants. We like to work with them because they're normally not going to buy a house, right? They're normally, you know, stable 12 to 15 to $18 an hour employees. They can pay their rent. That's what they do. They want modern, clean, and affordable. You don't need sparkling pools. You don't need fitness centers. You don't need the nine, you know, and that's what is really going on in this market. A lot of those high-end buildings are being built. We stay away from those because those are really have low cap rates, very little cash flow. They're more for institutional investors or for wealth wealth preservation. We're not looking for that. We're looking for wealth creation. So we're looking for the C properties. So look at the city and figure out where you want to invest in the city. The next thing I think you should do is you should really focus on trying to build a team. And the first team member you need is the real estate broker. Go on LoopNet, see who's listing all those properties on LoopNet, see who the brokers are. And there's not that many brokers in every city who deal directly with the bigger multifamilies. You'll have a lot of residential guys who sell duplexes and say, I'm multifamily. They're not really multifamily. They're more than on the residential side. Find those guys out. I have a I have an ebook, researching the market ebook, where it will give you the demographics and, and all the metrics you need to find. But more importantly, you need to learn how to ask certain questions from a real estate broker. You need to qualify yourself because if you sound like a newbie and someone who's not versed in this language, then it's going to come through in the interview and they're not going to want to deal with you. As long as they know they've got somebody who's in the market, who's hungry and who knows what he's talking about, they'll be more than happy to spend an hour on the phone with you and educate you about the market. So that's what you need to do. Once you're educated on the market, then you start talking about other team members. Start trying to network with insurance brokers, start trying to network with property managers and get out there. And you want those real estate brokers to start sending you deals. <clears throat> But you want to let the real estate broker know what you're looking for. Listen, I'm looking between 10 and 100 units. I'm looking for a C property. I'm looking, you know, in a, in a res really decent area. Maybe there's a path of progress going on. Get really specific with them. Let them know what you're what you're looking for. Because if all of a sudden he starts sending you listings that are not in your market, you're wasting his time and you're wasting your time. So become very specific on what you want what you want to invest in. I have, I have a question here, yeah, and I'm really glad you, you brought this up because this, this is super important. When you are doing your first investment, basically you are uh, um, uh, starting a, a track record for yourself. You're showing that this is, look, I'm an investor, this is my first deal, I, first deal done. What I'm mm -hmm. saying here is, would you look at, at your first deal as a smaller, uh, for a smaller deal, let's say a four unit or something like that, or you would look immediately at like a, a larger deal and then start to presenting it to investors? Because this is going to come up. Because I, I've been mm -hmm. through this, investors are going to, to ask you, what other, show me the other deals that you've done before. That's true. And and that's that's a catch-22. I mean, I, my only way I can answer that is that very specific to every individual. You listen to Grant Cardone, right? He goes, sure. go big on your first deal. I mean, okay, if you're scared and you don't go big, you're never going to go small. So you, some people need to go small in order to go big. So I think you have to look within yourself. I went small. I bought my first threeplex back in 2002. Then I bought the mobile home park, which is a big deal. So I think people need to start 
wherever they're comfortable, and they need to take action. No, That's no, the most but, important but, uh, thing. Sorry to interrupt, but, but I don't mean regarding uh, uh, out of acting as a place of comfort, because it's the same. It's a, That's right. You have the same work if you are applying to a job or start, I agree. Start, starting a company. What I'm saying is, would you say it would be best to look immediately at a larger deal? Or I would look at a larger deal. A larger uh, only deal. Because, okay. Only because the economy is a scale. I mean, anything five units, four units or less is residential. Anything five or bigger is commercial. So if you're going to buy a sixplex or you're going to buy 20 units, it's the same kind of financing. So 20 units will give you a little bit more of economies of scale, right? Because you have 20 units in one area, right? I'd rather have 20 units in one area than a little sixplex here and then a little fourplex there. So... Figure out where you want to start, but I would start at the bigger complex. You would because start at 20? 20 that's I would, yeah, I think, I mean, it all depends on the market because 20 units can cost 600,000 in Tennessee, but 20 units can cost 3 million in California. So it all depends right. where, and it all depends what kind of, you know, financing or what kind of down payment you can, you can come up and raise. So it's, it's important where you start, but I'm just thinking, you know, if you start in a million dollar range you can get Freddie Mac financing so that's great financing so it all depends where you want but I think 20 units is very comfortable because you can get a resident manager who lives on site who can help you with the manager of the property once you start getting larger if you've got a lot of capital hey listen I would love to start at the 100 unit level only because you can get a full-time maintenance guy you can get full-time management on there a leasing agent on there maybe a part-time person so all of a sudden the larger units give you the ability to start growing a business and that's what we learned on our third deal all of a sudden we're like wow we have some employees it takes some pressure off of Jake where he doesn't have to go knocking on doors collecting rent you actually have people that you can employ because you're generating enough revenue from these properties to put in proper management but uh, to, to, to get uh, you talk about Freddie Mac but uh, or, or Fanny, but uh, as an outsider, uh, remember we're having this European uh, thing going on mm -hmm. here. So, is this is this a no no? So you would you would have to recur to a, a hard money lender or some some because you, I mean. I don't know how you do it there, but you can go to community banks also. I mean, if you work with a, we, we, we don't even deal with Freddie and Fannie. We're just starting to go to them right now after our entire portfolio because they tend to be more expensive, right? They tend to, they, they tend to be a little tough sometimes because they want a bio, they want to know what color underwear you have. They're very, very, very specific. Yeah. They're, they're expensive and their terms weren't as great as our community. We had a community bank that was doing 15% down for us. They were doing 10 year terms. So we like to deal with community banks. Now, one of our community banks is tapped out. They can't lend to us anymore because they're a small community bank. Sure. I think we're going to shift over to the Fannie. So definitely, I, I would go to community banks. And if you want to go to hard money, there's guys out there that do hard money for sure. I don't want to call it hard money. Let's call it private money. Sure. And, and, hard money and, and, and then you would refi afterwards to get a, a, yes. a lower cost of capital, right? Yes, definitely. And in within what period? Would you, would you say like one year or as soon as you get a deal in place, you immediately start working to, uh, regarding the, the refi process? Well, yeah, you, it all depends because some banks have something called seasoning where they want to have at least six months of financials, right? Because the, you can take a property over that has doing terrible. All of a sudden, like that's what we did on our third property. It was generating $50,000 a month in revenue. Within eight months, we were at $80,000 a month in revenue. When we went to go refinance, banks were like, what happened? This is not possible, right? So they wanted, they, they didn't accept that we had just turned a compl property completely around. So we had to wait another couple of months for our numbers to actually have that continuous uh, going on. So it took us about a full year after for us to start approaching banks and saying, here, listen, this is what we want to do. We want to refinance this property out. So it all depends on, you know, what's going on. As far as the, as far as the private money goes, I would start as soon as possible. If you see a property that you can really turn around, start turning around, start showing those numbers and keep good numbers keep good records because you want to have actually as soon as you contact the banks you want to show those banks hey listen i was doing 10 grand a month now i'm doing 16 grand a month this has been for, it's been trailing for the last three or four months and then go to those guys and refinance so start that process as soon as possible sure and rega regarding um your your plays your engine um the index um play is always uh value add right so you take c properties and yep. get into b's is this is this what you're saying or c's even to c pluses i mean even if you don't change the class of the property you always have to understand what where the value is in the property is there is there is there not too much vacancy let's say the property is 90 92 percent occupied 
that market should be 98% right now. So there's six percentage points. So that's one where we can actually fill up the units. The second one is let's say they're not doing billing back the utilities. You can start billing the tenants for the utilities instead of you paying yourself. The third one is let's say the rents are under market, even by $30. If every rent is undervalued by $30, you have 100 units, that's $3,000 a month in potential sure. rent or $36,000 a year. At a seven cap, that's a lot of money that you can potentially add in value. Other, other ways, I've got a, an article on 50 ways to generate revenue other ways you can look at the laundry services hey are they doing laundry are they doing corn operated laundry on there can you add amenities to the property the big thing now here in the US is a lot of apartments have washer dryer hookups inside the unit tenants want that so if they want that and you have that on the property you can potentially add another 25 or 30 dollars a month just for offering that amenity another we just saw the other uh, the other day that we came across is on these higher properties the B B plus properties they want garbage valet. So maybe you can charge an extra $15 a month for picking up the garbage outside their apartments. You can have your maintenance guy every day picking up garbage. That's another 1,500 times 100 units. That's another $1,500 a month in revenue. You're talking about a guy who's already working there full time and it's a service that the tenant probably wants. A lot of these tenants would definitely want to be able to leave their garbage outside the door and you pick it up. So there's so many ways you're looking. Adding amenities, dog parks are huge here in, in Tennessee where Jake is. We add a small $3,000 dog park, put some fencing in, it adds a community atmosphere. Uh, we bought the property with a pool. Let's fix up the amenities on the pool. So all of a sudden you can start raising those rents a little bit and start adding value that way. Value add is thrown around so easily nowadays where people want to come into these apartments, start changing cabinets and start putting all, you don't have to do that on these C properties. As soon as you start stabilizing the property, take care of the outside, make the outside look good paint it, give them value for value. And once you start giving that value, that's when you can start raising those rents a little bit to market. How, how, do, you, how do you qualify the tenants? So how, how do you uh, remove the weeds from the people that are actually serious about paying rent on time and, and so on? That's a good question. I mean, that's all done internally. We learned from the very beginning, the first property we bought were weekly renters and weekly is great in one aspect, they pay more because people who are sure. poor can't budget their money. So their mindset is I get paid on Friday, I wanna give you my $170 for the week. Unfortunately, at the end of the month, it's like $100 more than what they would have normally paid for monthly, but they're not good tenants because they just turn over all the time. They're not reliable, so we're constantly turning over. So what we ended up doing is we ended up starting to screen. We are started using something called tenant reports, and now Appfolio has something where uh, we, we just do background checks on every tenant. Now, I'm not exactly sure what Jake, what our, our, our criteria is, whether it's a 600 credit score. You wanna make it three times what they're earning, but more importantly, you, wanna, you, want, you have to do background checks and credit checks on every single tenant. You wanna make sure they have a job. It's not about your gut feeling and it's not about charity here because you know I, I'm Catholic and I wanna be able to offer oh, but this a four thousand. No, exactly. Not, this is a business. Yeah, but I, I wanna make that, and that was I was hung up on that a lot for a lot because you know you feel sorry for people. So that's why you know when you're an investor, you wanna sort of, sort of disassociate yourself from the manager sure. aspect, not have any feelings because listen, <clears throat> They're there. If they're not paying, you're not paying your mortgage and, they and your family can't eat. And it's very, but it's very difficult for a lot of us to get over that because there's a lot of limiting beliefs and a lot of assumptions held up with money. So just look at it as you have to protect your investment. You have to get the most important, I guess, screening there. Um, are you going to make mistakes? Obviously. But if you don't screen, that would be the hugest mistake you can possibly do. And the other thing is try to keep it as a system. <clears throat> try not to break the system. If somebody doesn't fall, in that criteria, don't make exceptions to people. If somebody's late with the rent, you have to charge them a late fee and then you have to send them the letter. And you can't say to this person, I'm gonna do it and that person, I'm not. You have to keep it very similar to every single person because if not, you're gonna get in trouble doing that. We found a company called LeaseLock who provides insurance. Uh, unfortunately, they deal with you know properties of over 500 units, portfolios. But what's great is people can employ this on their properties. It's premium rental. If you have somebody who's marginal, who, you know, who has a job, who doesn't have any felonies, but falls below that, you know, that credit score, what they do is they, uh, they actually um, charge that tenant a premium of one month's rent. So about us, it's about $600. So the tenant can get screened from them. If they get accepted from lease lock, they'll pay lease lock $600. And it's an insurance that if they come onto our property. If they don't pay our property, they get evicted, lease lock will pay us the money and will pay us until we get that property re-rented. And they, you know, the, the, the the rate where they, they lose money is very small lease lock because they know what they're doing. And you know landlords can do this themselves. So if they have somebody like Gino who comes on the property, I'm 580 credit score, I'm a little bit below, but I've had a job for the last five years, I don't have any evictions, I'm not a felon, 
you can say to the tenant, hey, listen, I want a $500 premium for you to take this apartment because a lot of places he won't qualify. He knows that he needs to pay it. So you can pay it to get that extra $500, start another fund. You can start self-insuring yourself, put that money away. So if he ever does break out, you have that $500 to go back in, clean the property up or actually have that extra capital there. But how do, how do you collect rents? Is this, they, they transfer you on a monthly basis? Do you have a person knocking on the door, give me the check? How how that process That's a good away? question. When we, first, when we first started out, we were door knocking our 25 units. <laughs> and that was tough because, you know what? And, yeah, exactly. And and it was it was weekly renters. So Jake would be on the phone texting. And you don't want to become very – that that's becoming so personal, right? So what we ended up doing is you have the resident manager there. The resident manager says rents due every Friday. So on the, on the properties right now, we have – three different offices basically no cash you never want cash because cash is sticky not even for application fees or anything there's no cash involved in this you either want checks you can start doing ACH where people can pay uh, through through um, th online on through online payments okay. or you can take credit cards um, obviously the credit cards will be a little bit more expensive you let them pay the fee whether it's a 10 or 15 18 dollar fee it gets transferred over to them but you give the policy the rents due on the first if you don't have it there by the fifth it's a late fee. If you don't have it by the by the tenth, we're going to send out a notice. Fourteen days eviction. Very simple. I mean, you just have to learn eviction laws in the state that you're operating in because they're all different. But uh, here, basically, here, here in uh, in Europe, at least in Portugal, I don't know. I'm not aware of maybe the other states, but here in Portugal, uh, banks have this uh, system called direct debit. That means that kind of let's say utility or something, you basically sign <laughs> a contract until the end of the contract. They basically uh, kind of they charge your account every single month, mm -hmm. but, yes. but it's different than you transferring them. See the difference? You paying yes. them something, so they, they take out of your your account and that and that's it. This is what I wanted to, to make sure because I, I heard you talking about credit cards and, and checks. So uh, here in Portugal, um, we live in a rental and we pay the rent, so we transfer the, the money to to the um, to the owner of the household. Do you have this automatic procedure there where you Oh, you can, can do that, yes. Yeah, it is. And, but the thing is, it all depends on the tenant class you're dealing with. The lower tenant classes, sometimes they don't have bank accounts, right? So they've got to come oh. in with you with a money order. You have to, yeah, so, so it's all different classes. So it depends on who, what tenant you're serving. Some some tenants don't have the ability to have online. Let's say they don't they don't have banks online, so they've got to go to the post office, get a money order, or go to Seven Eleven, get some okay. type of payment. We 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 will take that because it's not cash. We do a check can, check scanning, so they bring the checks into the office. We don't have to have leasing agents running out to their banks, so the checks scan the banks right right in the office, and we have those. We have that online ability. We can have, we do have that online ability where if they want to set up an ACH, we can get it debit, credited debited every month from their account. But because if you are dealing with C-type C properties, you have a yeah. higher degree of variability because they are not uh, reliable, right? Let's, let's That's right. Like look at as it is. So because well, you know what? Yeah, because they're they're the first hit when the market takes a turn. They're not very savvy with their money. They don't have a lot of savings. So if they lose a job. You know, they're, they're two paychecks away from being on the street. So that, that's part of the problem. Um, that's why you want to do those background checks. You want to make sure that they've been employed for the last, you know, a couple of years, that they have that ability to, to pay that rent. We, we, we talked about, you know, we talked about a, a lot of stuff regarding properties. But what I, what I would like to, to focus our attention now is, let's say today you are looking at, um, I'm looking at a new deal. So what, what, are, you, what are you looking for? Can you run us through your, your process regarding what sure. you are looking for? Let's say you went on MLS, whatever the thing might be, just run us through your process. Sure. Well, I think the first thing that everybody has to do, I think you would agree with this, is you're trying to buy on actual numbers, right? Whether you're buying a business, whether you're buying a piece of property, whether you're buying any kind of investment, you want to buy on what's actually doing today. The problem is most sure. people in this inflated economy, inflated market, they're looking on what it can possibly do three years from now. Well, and right. we don't want to fall into that trap. And that's what a lot of people are doing because they're saying, hey, listen, rents have been going up for 10% for the last three years. They're going to continue to do that. That's not, they might, they might not. Sure. And if Excellent. they do, okay. that's your gravy. That's your rate of return. That's where you're making your money. So why would you pay a premium for something that's been sure. doing? So, Get the actual numbers. Look at the last 12 months of performance of what's going on with the property. That's the first thing you need to do. Wrap your mind around that. Don't say, hey, I'm getting, I think the second thing I, I just popped into my mind, don't fall in love with it. 
Okay, we tend to fall in love with properties. Keep your emotions out of it. This is the difference between single family and multifamily. Single family is all about the comps. It's all about what's going on with the neighbors. It's all about what's going on with the you know the property itself and the neighborhood. Multifamily is all about the net operating income. You want to see what's going on with the net operating income, and that's derived by income less expenses. That's what an operating income is. That's what you need to focus on. I think the third thing is look at what's going on inside the market. Cap rates, which are the rate of returns on properties, less any kind of debt service on them, are basically all different. In our market, we can still get seven caps to eight caps for C properties. More difficult, but it's not. Now, if you go to California and say, I'm looking for a seven cap, they'll laugh at you because it's not gonna. that's not happening. So as properties have escalated in price, those cap rates or rate of returns are dropping. So that's what's fueling this market. So it's harder to find those rates of return, but that's what I look for. We're looking between seven and eight caps because I don't want to invest in a property for anything less than that because there's just there's just too much risk involved. There's too much work involved. And I also look for properties that have problems. I'm looking for motivated sellers. If somebody's not motivated, and I'll list the motivations here in the United States, a lot of different motivated sellers, people who want to retire, people who are in business with their brothers or sisters who just have that acrimony, people who are burned out, people who are getting divorced, people who are going through a bankruptcy, people who are going through health issues, people who are getting relocated, getting a job and going elsewhere, going to another part of the country they have to sell, people who are living outside the market and are trying to you know, manage a property. There's so many. I'm just trying to think if there's one more that popped into my head. But there's just so many different types that you have to look for. And if you can't solve their problem, they're not going to sell at a discount. So that motivation is very, very important. And the other thing is you want to look for property that has, like you said, those value adds. Can you raise the rents on the property? Can you clean it up and maybe make it from a C to a B property where you're adding that kind of value? Can you take take control? Let's say all of a sudden you see the property is running. I'll give you an example. At 72% expenses to income. Well, that's really big. Can you knock that down to 56% and take control of those expenses by knowing how much things should cost in the market? Can you take over and make the management much better? Because this really is a customer care and this really is all about serving the customer and it's all about customer service. The number one reason why tenants leave your properties because they don't like customer service. They don't like what you've been doing to the property. They don't like how they've been treated. So if you can see that as a problem and solve that, you can take it over, take care of the management of the property and and you know run start running that property properly. So these are what we're looking for. We're looking for value adds on the property. But you're also looking for uh, outside economical uh, factors like let's say oh, a, yes. a, new, a new factory just going to open somewhere and then they are going to build something there. So you're looking for mm -hmm. those types of... Well, yes, and that's and that's because that's we had mentioned that uh, previously about focusing on the on the market. So you always talk about researching the market and choosing a market that has some type of growth aspect because I think real estate is really fueled by jobs. That's why I moved down to Jacksonville to this market. I missed it by about a year when I sold my house. Everyone's coming down to the southeast. Amazon's building a warehouse, super warehouse in Jacksonville. Healthcare is coming down here. Banks are coming down here. Insurance. So jobs fuel the market. Look where the jobs are going, and that's what you're looking for. We're fortunate that down in Tennessee, we bought a couple of properties next to factories. Those are our workers. Those are our type. So you want to see some type of population growth. You want to see some type of job growth in the market. You want to see enough employers in the market. You want to go to Rochester, New York, up 30, 40 years ago, there was one employer, Kodak. When that employer imploded and left, sure. left sure. the city in shambles. So you don't, you don't want that. You want to have a decent amount of different employers, different uh, opportunities for people to work and to have jobs. And regarding uh, regarding your due diligence process, because and this is important, <laughs> especially for me, because oh, yeah. I'm completely unreliable with details. That's that's a good end of my wife. She's like the dot in the eye. I'm more like the <laughs> creative type of person. So uh -huh. because I already know I'm going to miss a lot of stuff there. I need the accountant. So um, what are uh, some uh, some of you, I like to to hear your thoughts regarding the due diligence process when you are looking at a property before you're making your investment. Sure. So there's we have a three step due diligence process really quickly. I can tell you the first thing is the financial. When you get into a contract, you sign the contract. The first step is to look at the finances, get all those numbers. You want to make sure that he told you were doing a hundred thousand a month that you are actually doing a hundred thousand sure. a month. If he's not, then you want to go back and retrade and lower the price to what it should be. And if he's going to complain, you'll walk away from the deal. The second one is the physical due diligence. You want to actually in, actually get the inspector on board and have him go out and do look at all the units, make sure everything's good, to have him take pictures. But you don't do the physical inspection unless you're happy with the financial inspection, financial due right. diligence. Once the financial is done, you're happy, you don't want to spend money. 
send the inspector out. Once the inspector goes out, he reports back to you, says, Gino, you have 100 units, go through every single unit, spend the money to go through every single unit. There's six units here, you need to replace three air conditioners, you need to do this, you need to get a price on what you think it's gonna cost. You go back to the seller and say, hey, listen, I found this, would you like to take care of it or I'll take care of it myself? Uh, on the last deal, we got a credit for $30,000 to fix the stuff. They didn't want to handle it. And for us, it was great because we had in-house maintenance. It didn't cost us that much, but it was legitimate. We took pictures, so they said, you know what? We don't want to deal with it. After the physical is done, you go to the legal due diligence. You want to make sure that you're buying a property with 30 units that has a certificate of occupancy. It actually is 30 units. You want to make sure that there's no liens on the property. You want to make sure that it has clear title. So it's first it's financial, then it's physical, then it's legal. Wrap those three up. And you, you, when you are looking at a property, it's always regarding uh, close to where you live or you are comfortable buying something that is completely outside of your... That's a great question. I mean, I was at the point where I lived in New York. I couldn't buy anything near where I lived. It just didn't make sense. So my yeah, first investments outside the market man. were, I mentioned Rochester, New York. And why there? Like I said, there's no job growth. There's no nothing. But I was looking to cash flow. So I was buying these little duplexes for $50,000 and getting $1,400 a month in rent. So it was just a cash flow play for me. And I had only bought two duplexes up there. I couldn't scale up on that property. It just wouldn't allow me to scale up on the property. They didn't have enough big assets there. So that's what I said to myself. Well, I've got to go down south. Jake is going down south. Let me look down south. So I've always invested outside my market. You just have to learn how to deal with management companies. You have to learn how to vet them. You have to learn how to manage the manager. It's a different mindset. You're not being the, you're not being the landlord where you're going out there unclogging toilets and you're taking care of the sure, tenants. Sure. You have people to do that for you. So if you can't invest in your market, I would always tell you, tell you, learn how to deal with management companies, choose a market you like, maybe find the potential partner in that market and partner with that partner. If not, go into that market and start researching and start doing your due diligence in that market. But I, I think it's important, and it's kind of a, a, kind of a diagonal uh, question regarding business as, as general, because you, you want to hear them, I mean the property managers, with a grain of salt, right? Because your first call, I imagine, they would be telling you everything that you wanted to hear. But in reality, when you put a, a property manager, if you like grow a portfolio to the size of what you and Jake have, you I imagine you have like a, a bunch of property managers wanted to take care uh, take care of your property, but they may not be able to um, to to, That's do, right. to to do it. So, and yes. if you trust them to do it, they probably are going to die on your project, right? So, uh -huh. how do you classify look think pitfalls common pitfalls to look in property managers? When well, that's great. I mean. That's a great question because it just like goes back to the real estate broker. Are they selling duplexes? Are they selling bigger units? Okay, you need gotcha. to ask for referrals. You need to say, what's your portfolio look like? How many units on the management do you have? And it's like everything else in business, right? You outgrow your accountant. You outgrow your attorney. You outgrow your business partner sometimes. You're going to outgrow, hopefully you outgrow your property management company because when you first start out, maybe the management company that you hire only has 150 units on the management and you have a 20 unit. So you'll see they need to have systems in place. They need to be have software that's on the cloud. They need to be using that kind of stuff so you have to vet them do they have enough units on the management because if they only have 100 units on the management and you have a 300 unit portfolio they can't handle you they will not be able to handle you because they don't have enough personnel on there so you really need to actually vet them out real estate brokers insurance guys chamber of commerce great places to get referrals for property management companies and then actually do your due diligence on them you have to interview them you have to you know go by go drive by a couple of properties that they're managing take a look at them i mean they might be bad because the guy who owns them might not give them money to fix it but on the other hand sure. you'll see you'll see you'll see recurring themes if the first property looks nice the second property looks nice the third property looks nice then they probably have a pretty decent track record. But if it doesn't, hey, listen, the the land of Google right now, you Google people's names, you'll see reviews come up. I don't like reviews because usually people who leave reviews have something yeah. negative to say. Sure. But at the same time, if you've seen 15, 16 negative reviews and one positive review, that might give you a little ammunition, might give you a little insight into what they're doing. Sure. Um, you know, is, that, is there any, anything else that we haven't covered yet regarding uh, our European investors, our listeners uh, going, going into multifamily? Something that you think is really important for them to know that we haven't covered yet? I think what they need to do, I mean, it, I think we didn't mention this, but if you're if you're hesitant and you don't want to get into your first deal by yourself, maybe you find somebody who's syndicating a deal like myself. Um, I've got the model built out. Find somebody who's found the deal and say, listen, 
you don't have to pledge a lot of money. Maybe it's $25,000 to the investment, $50,000 to the investment. See how the investment works. Uh, see what's going on. See how these guys are doing their due diligence. Have them send over the property prospectus over to you. Have them show you why they're investing in the deal. It's a great way to get started into the market. And then all of a sudden, you've got your first deal. I mean, you don't, you don't own it, but you can put that on your credibility and say to investors and potential bankers and to potential partners, hey, I have a stake in this property in Tennessee. This is what these guys invested in. I love their model. I'm going to follow their model. So it's a great way quickly to get money into the market and to start investing in other people's deals and saying, hey, I'm, I'm an investor. I, have, I own a deal, right? Okay. You so know, I think I, that's what people should look at. You know, are you ready for our fire round? Yeah, I'm always ready. Sure. Sure. <laughs> give, it, give us a little, uh, let's say your five uh, best moments from, from all your shows, your five uh, most important lessons that you got from all the shows that you... you oh, wow. Have. Five most important. Yeah. Um, Brian Burke said he never goes on a property until after he buys it because he doesn't want to get emotionally attached to it. It's all about the numbers. Multifamily. Okay. Um, hmm. Number two. That's a, Number two. Uh, you know, Chris Urso, we had Chris Urso on, and I love Chris Urso because he, he talks about being big. It's all about passion for him. It's not really only about making money. He wants to go on, he sees a property, he envisions a property. He thinks it's really important to actually make that property look beautiful. That's his passion, that's what's fueling him, that's why he's successful. Number three, Noah St. John. It's all about limited mindset. It's all about junk in your, in your head. It's all about asking the right question, the empowering question, not how do I lose weight? I'm fit. I'm physically fit. Sure. If you say, how do you lose weight? Or if you say to yourself, why am I fat? Your mind's going to say to himself, yeah. you're going to answer, you're going to, you're going to find the answers to those questions. This is very important. Go on that Noah St. John podcast because it's really important. And we talked about it before. You want to ask yourself the right question. Why am I rich? Why am I successful? Because if you are, your mind's going to ask, find the answers to those questions. But if you keep saying, why am I making mistakes all over again? You're going to find answers to those questions. That one threw me off. Number four, I think was Tom Wheelwright from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, one of the advisors. Yeah, he talks about accounting and about taxes. Taxes are there to stimulate, um, to stimulate how we spend money, right? Taxes aren't there to punish people. Entrepreneurs get a lot of benefit from taxes. The poor and the working class get hammered by taxes. Know where you want to be. Know where you want to play. Do you want to be an entrepreneur and be in a tax friendly, or you want to be a W two and be taxed taxed heavily? Um, fifth one. I'm trying to think of another guy. Hmm. I've had so many. Whew. Thor Conklin. Uh, the last one we had. He's a business coach, profitability coach. You're going into business to make a profit. <laughs> That's what you're going into business for. Focus on paying yourself first. Hard for most of us to do, right? Focus on paying yourself first. That's really important. You know, um, I'm going to give you a breather here. <laughs> Not. <laughs> and just ask you, give us, give us uh, your top two, top two biggest mistakes you did in real estate. The things that you are always in the back of your mind and say, I'm never going to do that again. Well, it's all about coming back to buying right. I will not buy a property wrong. I, I just sold a property three days ago that I owned for 10 years. Best learning mistake I ever made. It cost me a lot of money. It cost me a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of focus away from other things in life, a lot of negativity. I finally sold it. It was an inheritance money that I got from my parents and I put the money there 10 years ago. Don't buy wrong. Make sure you're buying in a decent market. Do not buy wrong. Buy on actuals and know why you're buying it. Have the other thing is have the exit strategy. Why am I buying this? I didn't know I was buying. I was buying it because it looked nice. I thought it'd make money, but I really didn't have the clarity and the reason why I was buying it. That's my second mistake. Just uh, really know why I'm getting into it. And actually, the exit you, strategy. you saying you saying that that uh, I just came up with something that's important. Do you uh, what's your holding a typical holding period of a property, or you actually keep the properties forever? Besides, the, it's the funny. Way. I, we try to do it forever, but the market has escalated. We bought a property for $37,000 a unit two and a half years ago. The market's in the mid-60s now. I mean, we've made a lot of money. So right now, the return on the equity, the return on the dead equity is really bad right now. So we're considering selling it. I mean, three years ago, I would never would have thought to sell, but there comes a point in the market where you just have to say to yourself, if I can repurpose that capital, repurpose that equity into a different asset and make more money, maybe you do that. So I would say long-term forever, we want to cash flow, but if you can have that money, take that money and repurpose it into something else, 
I would consider doing that. So it would be like I don't know. What are you saying? Like five years, seven years, ten years? I would. I would say. I would say at least ten years. Right now, like I mentioned, Brian Burke, he's underwriting assets for seven to ten years, only because that's where the market is right now. He's expecting a correction, so he doesn't want to underwrite something for three years and all of a sudden he gets caught in that correction. He's looking for the long term, so he can ride out any corrections. That's why if you buy right. Even with that correction, you're still going to be insulated. You're still going to have enough equity in the property. You're still going to be able to pay your bills and keep it for the long term. And how, how many properties do you look at before you buy one? So uh, give the, the comps, the number of comps that you... Well, when you first start out, unfortunately, it will take you dozens, if not 50, 60, 70, not actually going out and physically looking at them, sure. but just running numbers. Right. And you know, when you get to be good, you can run the numbers in three, four minutes on a deal. So you want to look at as many as you can. But that's the reason why you want to focus on a specific part of the city, specific Makes market. Sense. So you're only looking at those. You don't want to look all over the US. So become focused. That'll cut down the number of deals you look you're looking at. Now we can look at three or four deals, five deals, maybe let's say 10 deals before we can actually buy one. But those deals are harder to come by now. So there's less deals to analyze as far as that. So um, you'll get better as time goes on. Just keep crunching those numbers and you'll get really good at it. Gino, give us your five books. Is your bookworm just like me? Your recent, five books. Your, your, re, your recent ones. I make it really easy for you. Recent ones. I, I'm actually reading right now. I like Brendan Burchard. So Motivation Manifesto. I think he's awesome. Uh, Gary Keller, The One Thing. Sure. Richest Man in Babylon, I think is is awesome. Uh, I'm reading a book by called Boundaries, um, something that uh, Dave Ramsey recommended to me because I want to be, I'm becoming a financial coach. We need to have boundaries in life. We need to be able to say no. It's very hard for me to say no to my family. I moved down to Florida. No, I have to leave. It's time. So we need to learn how to say boundaries. And it's really hard for entrepreneurs because we have to satisfy everybody. So it's very difficult to do that. I mean, the fifth one, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. I mean, obviously, everyone says Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The Kiyosaki books, really, all those books, they really had a really tremendous, uh, you know, they really shaped my life earlier on all about investing it's all about the mindset he doesn't unfortunately he doesn't go into the how you do it but as long as you can get into the why and he explains to you all about income and expenses being on the bi triangle as opposed to the you know es his whole quadrant you learn that it'll change your mind completely and it was really revolutionary for me gino uh, regarding your family and you as, as yourself as a person as a dad as a proud uh, dad just like me uh, what makes you happy Oh, going to the beach. I mean, actually spending time with them. Um, I homeschool the kids. So uh, I spend a lot of time with them in the morning. I want to teach them values. I want to be the uh, role model for them. I don't want them to look at LeBron James and say, I want to be like him. I want my kids to grow up and say, I want to be like me. I want my daughters to marry someone like me that's going to take care of them. That's a good person. That's the most important thing. You want your kids to look at you. And how do you do that? It's not by words, by telling them what to do. It's by acting a certain way, by being responsible, by being loving, by being there and actually being present, by listening to them. It's not just the time you spend, but how you spend that time with them and by making them the most important. It's very difficult with six kids, but you need to focus on them each and every time. One goes in for a walk with me in the morning. One goes for a walk with me in the afternoon. I put one to sleep at nighttime. So it's all about spending time with them, spending quality time with them. You know, uh, finally, where, where can our listeners get a hold of you? Uh, website is jakeandgino.com. Tons of free resources on there. We have the podcast, Wheelbarrow Profits. I'm going to send you a link. They can download our book for free, uh, Wheelbarrow Profits, the best-selling book. It talks all about our strategy. I think they'll really love the book. Let them dive into it. If they have any questions, they can email me at gino at jakeandgino.com. We have a very robust social media presence. We're on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. Hit me up on LinkedIn at Gino Barbaro. Um, we are on Instagram. Jake likes to do Snapchat. We've got a pretty good YouTube channel. So we're all over the place. Type in Jake and Gino. We'll pop up everywhere. And listen, I love to talk, as you can tell. Email me any questions. I love to answer people's questions. Because you know what? You ask me a question. If I don't know it, I've got to pull out a book and learn all about it. And that's what's great about teaching is you learn every more. You never become an expert in anything. Experts are only guys who are constantly on this progress, on this path of learning more and more. So that's what's great about this whole progress, you this know, process. It, it was wonderful having you on, on our show. Just, just, just a, a quick word. You're obviously a giving person because you are a chef, you have six, yes. kids, you have six kids, you are willing to, to teach people. So this is all about giving. And this is the mentality I just wanted to, to share with our listeners because when you start changing the way of uh, looking at things and say, how can I provide value and help? You will always have a seat in the table, at least with our That's chef. Right. <laughs> That's right. Gino. Gino, it was wonderful I, having you on. I agree. Show.
thank you very much. You have a great weekend, and uh, I hope to see you and speak to you soon, all right? Sure, sure. We'll do. We'll do. Have a nice thank day. Thank you. Bye.